Hello students, Mr. G here, the Enlightened Educator, to talk today about how to use the TI-84 Plus calculator in AP Calculus. We'll do several things. First, we'll look at some of the basic calculator features. Then we'll look at how to store and recall values that you might need in calculus computations. Then we'll look at how to compute calculus values from the graphing screen. And finally, we'll look at the math menu of the TI-84 to see how that we can access the calculus functions within the calculator. To demonstrate the features of the TI-84, I'm using the TI-84 emulator that I downloaded from the TI website. If you do not have your own TI-84 with you at home, you could download it as well and use it in place of the calculator. We're all used to doing simple calculations like 5 times 8, we know it equals 40. But have you ever noticed that after you get an answer like that, if you continue calculating plus 1, that the calculator clearly is taking an answer, it's taking this value that it must have stored in memory somewhere, and now it's adding 1 to that. And if we hit enter, we can see that the calculator success Successfully took that earlier value that it held in memory for a moment and used it as computation. That's important to us when we have to save and recall values in calculus. The other thing about the calculator that we have to keep in mind, the calculator can only do ca calculations. It can only deal with numbers. So even though it appears we're doing calculus on the calculator, understand the calculator is just using a numerical approximations to approximate the analytical work that we might do uh, when we understand and apply the rules of calculus. There are really two ways to tap into the calculator's uh, calculus abilities. One is through the graphing screen. So I've put two functions here into y1 and y2, and if I graph them, I see this. This could be something that you'd experience on an AP calculus problem. The TI-84 has a graphing uh, calculation uh, window, and you can access it by hitting second trace. You're really getting this calc feature. So if I use second trace, you'll see that a menu comes up, and we can see that the computer can calculate all sorts of things. And in particular, these last three items could be important to us on the AP exam. So let's go back to the graph and consider. It might be important, especially if we were doing integration, that we know the intersection between these two curves. If we were integrating from some value up to some other value, maybe to determine an area, for example, between the two curves. So to do so, from the graphing screen, we're going to do the second trace, which brings up the calculation, and we're going to choose the intersect uh, function. And when we choose that intersect function, You'll see that near the bottom of the graphing screen, it says first curve, and it's going to ask a second curve in just a moment. So if we keep the cursor on the blue curve in the vicinity of the intersection, it doesn't have to be right on the intersection, and we hit enter, we will be answering the computer's question, what is the first curve? Now, you notice as soon as I hit enter, the calculator took that first curve information, and now it's asking for the second curve. And I can see that I'm on the red curve, I'm in the vicinity of the intersection of question, so I'm going to hit enter again. And I have no idea why this asks us if we want to guess the value. I think that's silly. But it'll compute the intersection, and it finds the intersection to be 1.4608, yada, yada, yada. Now, if we were doing integration, and this was going to be one of our limits of integration, it might appear that we'd need to write down this big, long number, 1.4608, yada, 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 so that when we do our computations, we'll be taking all of the possible digits so that our answer will be as accurate as possible. Well, that would be a real pain to have to carry those values around. So we're going to use the store and recall feature of the calculator to store that value and then recall it whenever we need it. Before, I mentioned the clipboard of the calculator. And the first thing we want to do is we want to take this value that's on this graphing screen and we want to put it into the clipboard. Now, it might not be intuitive, but right now since that cursor is blinking, the cursor is active on the graph. But if I press Enter, the blinking cursor is going to go away, and now this is a real static display right here. Now, it wouldn't be obvious to you, but by pressing enter, I just put this value, x.14608, into the calculator's clipboard. So now I want to store that value somewhere so that I can use it later. The way that we're going to store is we're going to go down to the lower left portion of the calculator. You see the STO arrow? Well, this is the storage feature. If we push store, it says it's going to take the answer. That means the value that we put in the clipboard when we hit enter, and it's going to put it into a location that we define. Now, the locations where we save values in the calculator are just le lettered cells. So I'm going to put this answer in letter cell A. So I'm going to use the alpha feature over on the left side of the calculator to choose the letter A. So if I do alpha A, you'll see that an A occurs now, so it looks like the answer is going toward cell A. Now, I haven't yet executed that command, but as soon as I hit enter, 
that value that I had saved from the graphing screen is now in cell A, and we will recall that value in a subsequent calculation. Going back to the graph screen, we'll investigate the other calculations that we can use uh, from the second trace feature or the calculation menu from the graph. And let's look at number six, dy dx. We all recognize that's going to be the derivative. And the computer wakes up. You can see that the cursor is on a curve, and it shows us the x and y value. That's the location of the cursor. But suppose that I want to compute the slope of this curve at x equals 1. If I use the trace features, the arrows left and right on the calculator, I can get close to 1, but no matter what I do with my cursor, I never hit exactly at x equals 1. Well, the solution for this is, and again, it's not very intuitive, but we can do a direct entry right now. So instead of taking the x value of the cursor, we can just type in number 1. So I'm going to go to the calculator, push 1, and the calculator is obviously saying, oh, you want me to use x equals 1? And my answer is yes. So if I hit enter, it will execute that command. And when it does so, it's going to put the cursor at x equals 1. We can see this from the coordinates of the cursor. And it also computes the derivative. And you see the derivative is negative 0.99999. Well, actually, if you did this analytically on this function, you would compute that the dy dx, or the derivative at x equals 1, was negative 1. But we can see that it's an extremely accurate uh, estimation. The other calculus computation that we can do from graphs is the integral computation or calculation number 7. So when I select 7, once again, the calculator is looking for some input. And down at the lower left edge of the graphing screen, you can see it's asking for a lower limit. And since we know what numerical integration is about, it makes sense that the calculation would involve a lower limit. And in a moment, we would expect the calculator to ask for an upper limit as well. So again, I'm going to do a direct entry rather than trying to hit the spot on the trace, which I'd never be able to do accurately. So I'm going to press 1, hit Enter. And that takes care of the lower limit. You can see what the calculator displays here. And now for the upper limit, I'm going to integrate all the way to x equals 3. So I'm going to, again, do a direct entry from the keypad, hit Enter. And the computation computes the area and, I'm sorry, computes the integral and shades the integral. Now, notice what it says the value of the integral is. The value is 0. Well, that's actually no surprise if you consider the symmetry of this curve and the fact that we know in calculus there would be a positive quantity here and a negative quantity there. And when you add those two quantities, you'd end up with a combination of the two. In this case, adding positive and negative equals zero is no surprise at all. If you, however, were intending to compute the area of these two regions, this calculation would obviously not do it because we know that that area is something other than zero. We'll look at how to access the computer's functions to deal with that in just a moment. A moment ago, we looked at how to compute the derivative uh, of this curve at x equals 1, but there's another way to access that that has a lot more uh, capabilities, and that is through the math menu. So if you look at the left side of the calculator, there's this math button, and by pushing that button, that'll give us access to a lot of the calculator's mathematical functions. Now, you have probably used things like the numerical functions up here, maybe, for example, to do absolute values. We'll look at that in just a moment, but in the math computations, there are a few right down here at the bottom that are really interesting. This is numerical differentiation and numerical integration. So let's do the same thing this time. Let's compute that same derivative of that same function at x equals 1. So I'm going to choose selection 8, and you'll see that the display looks exactly like you might write this out if you were in a calculus class. So the first order business is the computer needs to know what you're using as a variable. Now I'm going to use x as the variable in all of these computations, but you can define other variables a, b, y, or whatever suits you. So I'm going to press the X button to say I'm differentiating with respect to X because the calculator or the equation that I'm going for has X in it. So what is that equation? Well, I've forgotten what that equation is, but I know that I have it saved in Y1. So there's a great feature that allows us to reach into the calculator, find that equation in Y1, and substitute it right here so that we're taking the derivative of that particular function. Now, you could do direct entry as well. For example, if you wanted to take the derivative of 6x cubed, sorry, 6x cubed at, oh, say, x equals 2. And when we press enter, the computer will make that computation. But again, we're going to go back and we're going to tap into that y1 equation that we've already saved. So I'm going to go again to math 8. 
to bring up the derivative. I'm using x as the variable because that was the x in the y1 equation. And now to get y1, y1 is one of the variables that has been defined in the calculator. So if you look just below the navigation cursors, you see that VARS button. That's the variables button. So we're going to click that. And it gives us some options, but the one that we're going to be most interested in is this Y VARS. That means the Y variables. So we're going to use the navigation button right to go and highlight Y variables. And we're just going to choose functions. Whenever you take other courses, you'll learn about the parametric and polar equations. But if I select that by hitting enter, we get this list of all of the Y functions. And since we have that equation in Y1, I'm going to choose Y1 by selecting the number 1 and it appears. Then I'll arrow over, and earlier we computed the derivative of that function at x equals 1, so I'm going to do the same thing again. And when we do so and hit enter, we get exactly the same value that we had before. So it's doing the same kind of numerical computation. Remember, it's only computing uh, the slope of a little tiny segment of that graph. It is not actually differentiating and then substituting the way that we do it analytically. Being able to tap into that Y1 feature is a real time saver on the AP exam. So now let's investigate Math 9. So if I go to Math 9, again, screen comes up and it looks very familiar, just like my calculus notation. And we're going to use a lower and upper limit of integration. Now right now I'm just going to choose um, um, 1, arrow up, 3. And you can direct enter an equation if you want to. Just out of curiosity, we're going to do sine x. And again, just like with the differentiation, the computer needs to know what variable you're integrating with respect to, and in this case, it's going to be x. Now, I do notice one thing I need, and now we're ready to go. We hit enter, and there's the computation. You'll recall that a moment ago when we computed the value of the integral of that function in y1 on the interval 1, 3, we got a value of 0. We should get the same thing whenever we do the integration through the math menu. So we'll go back to math 9. And in this case, we're going to put in the function that is in y1. So again, I'm going to do a direct enter the limits of integration. Cursor over, vars, y vars, 1, 1, and x is our variable. And when we hit enter, we get exactly the same value. There's no surprise there. But what if we intended to compute the area rather than the value of the integral? Well, we'll have to use the absolute value to make all of our values positive. It's helpful to remember that the calculator only does numerical calculations when we're doing things like the area computation. So let's imagine how we're going to have to set up that integral. If we do math 9 to bring up the integral, I know my limits of integration will be 1 and 3 as before. But now the issue becomes, how do we deal with the absolute value? So should the absolute value go on the outside of the integral, within the integral? Well, if we think about the graph, it'll help us understand. So if you think about what the calculator was doing, it was just calculating the area of a whole lot of little Riemann rectangles, areas that were positive, areas that were negative. Now, how would you tell the calculator to make all of these value positive? Well, you wouldn't have to say anything to it. If you said absolute value, then it would just maintain its positive value. But how would you tell the calculator to make each one of these individual calculations positive as well? You'd use the absolute value. And since the calculator is calculating each one of these little Riemann rectangles, that means that on our display, we can put the absolute value signs inside the integral. So if we go integral from 1 to 3. Now to access the absolute value, we'll go to the math menu again. So if we push math, you'll recall that there are these numerical math features. If we cursor over 1, 
we'll see that the first one is absolute values. So if I select that, then in the display, I can see the absolute value symbols. And now I'm going to go back and tap into that Y1 once again. So I'm going to go to VARS, Y VARS, 1, 1, and X is our variable in our equation, so we'll have to put X here. And now when we execute this by pressing the Enter button, we get an actual value, which is exactly what we would expect in this variation of that computation. You'll recall that a few moments ago, we took the value of this intersection between these two curves and we stored it in the computer's memory in memory cell A. So let's see how we can pull that value out and use it in computations. So let's say that we were doing an integral and the integral had to go from this intersection of the two curves to let's say x equals 3. So if I go once again to math 9, I'll bring up an integral. And in order to evaluate the integral from that stored value, all I have to do is put the letter A in this box of the integral. So I'm just going to do alpha A, and that tells the computer to use the value that is in cell A. And I decided that upper limit of integration was going to be 3. We're still going to be doing the Y variables and we're still doing y1, and the, the x is the variable in this case, and whenever we hit enter to execute, it gives us a value that is a bit over negative 1. If we go back to the graph, we can see if this answer makes sense. If we were integrating from x equals roughly 1.4 up to x equals 3, we'd be taking a positive region here, and adding to it a negative region there. And you can tell that the negative region is larger than the positive region, so it makes sense that the value of the integral would be negative. So just a quick summary. The calculator has its own kind of clipboard. And one of the ways we get values into that clipboard is hitting the Enter key. We can compute calculus quantities from the graphing screen using the Calculate menu for graphs. In this case, if I were computing the intersection of these two curves, I could use that feature to give me the intersection. Now that intersection with all of its digits might be important to a computation later on, so I can put this value into the computer's clipboard by just pressing Enter. When I press Enter, then the computer will no longer be looking at the graph. Now it's thinking about this numerical quantity. And straight from there, I can do Store. And in this case, I'm going to store it in cell B and hit Enter. Now we can also get to calculus functions through the math menu. And let's say I was integrating, and suppose in this case I wanted to integrate that region between the first intersection and the second intersection of those two curves. Then I could do all of this and whenever I execute this, that now gives us the value of that integral, the area between the curve for those two intersections. I hope this has been helpful, and of course, if you have questions, just to ask, everyone's helpful.